Today on the Ever Onward podcast, we have a very special guest, Corey Jackson. Um, Jack, Corey is the president of Jackson Food Stores. It's a chain of 363 convenience stores located in six western states. He's a board member of the Jackson Company. If anyone here in the Treasure Valley or Idaho know about the Jacksons, they're a legacy family here. They have multiple businesses. Um, all of them are, are, are integrated and vertically integrated. It's going to be great to talk about all the different service lines they have in today's podcast. Um, Corey has been with the Jackson Companies for 22 years. Uh, first 12 years as president of Capital Distributing. Um, today, the Jackson Companies employ over 4,500 uh, employees. He's a graduate of the University of Utah and received a BS uh, degree in finance. Um, he's worked for the family business for a long time. And again, uh, one of the legacy families in Idaho, we are very pleased to have on today, Corey Jackson. And before Corey Jackson, we have Ryan Cleverly, the COO and CFO of Alquist on, who's going to give us an update on our 10 mile project and what's been going on there over the last few weeks. Ryan, have you ever worked this hard? Uh, probably at some point. I don't know. <laughs> it's... You ever stop? That's the challenge. Like you just keep going. Really big news this week. We had yeah. a press release that went out on our project at 10 Mile, known as the district. It's been very public. Just got its preliminary plat approval through the city, but we're pleased to announce today. I'll let you do it. Oh, I don't know if I feel <laughs> I feel guilty announcing it. It was, it, it, um, to your point, a lot of hard work going on behind, behind the scenes and working closely with the Blacks family. And, you know, we've had many meetings with them, phone calls, and kind of came to a really good point this week of uh, where they're, uh, we're going to work with them as being their developer on the site and letting them kind of carry the land, so to speak, and, and be a part of the, the process of developing, yeah. which is actually really exciting versus just saying, hey, you're out, we're buying it, you don't really have any say going forward. It's such a critical piece, I think, to their to their legacy, I think it's it's a great fit and a great partnership. Um, we're excited to work with them. It's 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 always interesting. I mean, I've only been in a couple of meetings with them, but the the little interaction I've had with them has been really good to to meet that family and get to know them and the story behind it all. It's yeah. been good. So third generation development family. Yeah. Uh, Brian Black uh, and uh, his son Cody, and then Brad, uh, yeah, brother in law. So it's great. So yeah, we sent out a press release uh, last night actually. Um, yeah. Uh, reporting that uh, partnership and so we're really excited for that um for those who don't know th those that, those projects are just big it's probably one of the biggest ones we've ever done compared to the you have the 118 next to it 118 acres yeah that's already final platted then we have the 104 that goes with it so in, in combination it's well over 200 acres at that interchange it's a big project it's a big project and and it's interesting because i mean if you go get a little project done nobody ever calls you right <laughs> and no one really reports negative yeah. news because it's just whatever yeah and now you get a lot of different opinions about it that are out there but generally speaking what i would say is i've had more positive phone calls yeah. and just congratulations on this because it is it's an instrumental piece in the whole treasure valley yeah. i mean and it, and it needs to be what we're going to make it become or help it become with the blacks yeah. family and and i think it's going to be something that we'll look back on our career i mean downtown's incredible you go look at the buildings yeah. that we were able to do down there and you're going to see something out here you're going to drive your grandkids by there one day yeah. and say, look at what we were able to pull off. You know, Fred says it a lot, but we're creating addresses, places for yeah. people to go, places for people to take their family for the next decades, and it's really special. But a lot of and a lot of great work by the city. Oh, you work so closely with, with them, them, being in the city of Meridian, uh, led by Mayor Simison, uh, city council there, all the way down to the staff, yeah. their planning department. Uh, it's been a big effort, but it was great to get through two weeks ago. And now it's really great to good. announce the partnership announce with that. Blacks. Yeah. Isn't it funny that you work with a city and there's meeting after meeting after meeting, you get to one night or two nights <laughs> of discussion. You're like, it's coming down to this, but the reality is it needs to come down to that. And that's great. But super thankful to the city of Meridian for all the hours that they've spent in on the, spent on this so far and, and a lot more to come. But I'm actually excited about now the next level of, of press releases that will keep coming yeah. out to tell yeah. people what we're going to do there. It's going to be great. I agree. We'll need to get Brian Black on, too, to talk yeah. about his family's legacy That'd be as well. awesome. Thanks for the update. You bet. Well, usually we just get right started because there's probably a lot to talk about, and some of the stuff we talk about up front is the best stuff. Perfect. We're just not going to talk about gas prices going up or down. Perfect, because I don't have any answers to that. <laughs> I like, liked your dad's answer a couple weeks ago. He's like, hey, 
Don't talk to me about him going back down. I'll talk to you about him going up all you want. Yeah. He's so funny. Because if he knew the answer to that question, he wouldn't need to talk to anybody. <laughs> Corey Jackson, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. Okay. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. Hey, can we start with your dad's birthday? You bet. I missed it. I was uh, I was out of town, but yeah, I'm, how was it? It, w- it was a good time. Uh, you know, we talked about doing that party for about a year. We've been joking about it because, you know, we'd have a conversation that the answer is always no, we're not going to do that. And three and a half weeks before the party decided to do it and we threw it together real quickly but we had a good time and it was a lot of fun yes we just turned 70 turned 70 what a legend i got to be with him like a week and a half ago and uh, can we start there sure i know we'll go probably a lot of different places but so john jackson born and raised in homedale right correct and his dad had a his dad was a business guy right correct talk talk about your it would be your grandpa well my grandparents um they opened a uh, gas station in Homedale in 1950 and uh, my cousin Piper uh, did a history project on that in high school and interviewed my grandmother and we learned that uh, they borrowed $2,500 from her parents to lease that gas station and they ran that for a number of years and you know, my dad started on his own with his own station in Caldwell in 1975 but um, yeah we've been selling fuel in, in Idaho for 74 years. And I, I've seen a picture of that. That was a Texaco station in Caldwell, right? What well, my dad's first sight was a Texaco in Caldwell, correct? Yeah, I think I've seen the picture, the old black and white picture of it. Yep. <clears throat> that when I was with him uh, last week, I, I, look, I said to him, I said, man, do you ever think back? Because he's, he's only 70. That's a, that's a lot of stuff he's accomplished in a relatively short time. Yeah, he... he um... He, he he got after it early and and um, you know I don't think he ever expected this to happen and somebody asked him recently you know uh, you know what was the secret to your success and you know I, he, he said I just got started early and worked hard and one thing led to another and pretty soon you get momentum and and uh, one day I looked up and it's hard to believe all the things that we were doing I'm gonna, can I dig a little deeper? I'm going to ask you. So one of the things you hear from people that know him is uh, how much he cares about people and how much he cares about his business. I mean, there's these stories of him, the care he takes for the business, the customer, and then the people. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a very grounded individual, low ego guy. And, uh, you know, he, he can be quite demanding at times and he'll push you real hard. But just about the time he thinks he pushed you over the edge, he'll do something special and and uh, dust you off and, and throw you back in. But yeah, he cares about uh, his employees, the business, certainly the community, and uh, he's done numerous things that you know I've never heard from him, but I hear about from other people. And um, you know he's he's got a passion for business and the community and people, and I think that's kind of the secret to what he's been able to do. He. Uh, um uh, my favorite John Jackson story is one of the first times I've ever like on a panel with him and we were at Boise State and this was oh, it was probably 10 years ago maybe 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 longer in their business department and they had a panel of, of business leaders and they were going around the table and they were talking about social impact and there was a lot of ideologic hey you've got to have a bigger meaning for life and what are you doing social impact wise and a lot of really flowery kind of philosophical things and it's going around and it, 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 it honestly was kind of fascinating because you're talking about, hey, all this esoteric kind of business and good for the world thing. And it gets to him. And and I didn't really notice that he was kind of ready to go. But when he got to him, he was ready to go. And he said, hey, listen, he's like, I, I don't know about all this other stuff you guys are talking about. And then he went on this impassioned like soliloquy on, hey, I'll tell you what I do. I create jobs for people. I provide for their families. I care about them. And over the years... I'm profitable. And he said, that's what we're about is taking care. And it was like this drop the mic moment where he was like, it brought everyone back down to earth. And I got, I had chills at the time. I'm like, that's the guy I want to be like, right? I mean, the guy that actually has done it and you know, uh, it's just talk about his business acumen, how it was growing up under someone like that. I'm going to get into your, where you've taken this thing, but um, sure. What'd you learn from him? Well, a lot. I mean, you know, he, he had an accounting background. He's always been about the numbers. And uh, so, you know, 
the numbers don't lie, and he usually starts with the numbers and finishes with the numbers, and he, he doesn't uh, like, um, he likes to keep it simple. He's generally, you know, likes few words, and, you know, we're in a meeting, he, I've heard him say things like, you know, just tell me what time it is, don't build a clock for me. Um, or if you use words like, as far as I know, he'll look at you and say, how far do you know? And, uh, or if you use, you know, adjectives to describe numbers, like it, it, you know, it's, it's a big project or there's a lot of money involved. And he's, you know, I don't like adjectives when, when there's numbers, just tell me the number. Um, but you know, keeping it simple, um, not trying to hit a home run, um, mm. just, you know, he's always said business is fundamentally simple and, uh, if it's too complicated, it's probably not meant to be, um, you know, he, he's says things like, you know, the, the sexier, the business, the less money there is in it. Um, so he, he likes to under promise and over deliver, um, in everything we do. And, you know, it, and certainly that all comes back to people. Um, uh, you know, he's, he never embellishes and he never lies. And, uh, wow. and oftentimes those conversations are tough and he can be tough on people, but at the end of the day, uh, people have a lot of respect for the fact that they always know where you stand with him at all times as painful as that can be sometimes because he, he certainly doesn't sugarcoat anything and there's been times when he probably could have toned it down just a little bit but it's not in his nature to really think about how he's given the message just as long as the message is short clear and concise and um, you know sometimes that's painful but at least you know where you stand it's awesome man the, the amount of wisdom that was just in that last two minutes uh is crazy um he he reminds me a lot of my dad actually there uh, my dad's older than him but um he uh he does like a, like a, it's just kind of cut from a different cloth kind of hey this is the way we just blue collar it's the way we do it um and i i love it i just love being around him um how was it being his son because that's different right you're business you're his business partner and we'll talk about that but how was it being his son uh, well, it, it's certainly different, and you know we've talked about that at times. But I mean, being his son was great. I mean, he always, uh, you know, took time to be involved in the things that we were doing. He always took time to make us feel like we were part of the business. And uh, you know, I was born the year that he opened that first site, so I, I was there the full step of the way. And and you know, early in my career, uh, at sometimes I felt like it almost was my business because I was there the whole time. But as I got a little older, I, I certainly understood that it wasn't um, entirely like I thought it was at one point in time. But, you know, he, he was a great father and, and uh, certainly been a great boss, you know, a lot of hard lessons. But, you know, there are times when, you know, there we're having conversations and I say things like, well, as your son, I would say this, but as your employee, this is what I think. Mm. And sometimes we have to draw a distinction there just to make sure we're okay wow had to be incredible and and so as the business grew talk a little bit about the different service lines you have and how you kind of divvy that up because it's become it's 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 a big organization now Corey. i mean it's you think about jackson jet center and the fuel business and your distribution facility and all of the acquisitions and, sure. and stations you have everywhere well, you know, it started with one location in 1975 and it was a service station. Um, so, you know, my dad was a mechanic. He was selling tires and doing oil changes and full service fuel. And in the late seventies, you know, he acquired a few different locations, saw what 7-Eleven was doing. Mechanics were hard to hire. So uh, we started converting the sites to, con to convenience stores. I believe it was 1980, Texaco pulled out of the market. So you had an opportunity to purchase um, I think they had one truck at the time that was selling wholesale fuels to what we call dealers. Hmm. Um, so it really started with, you know, our company operated sites that became convenience stores, uh, our dealer network um, that we, you know, we supply wholesale fuels to a number of dealers throughout the West. And then in 1984, um, we started capital distributing with a couple of gentlemen that worked for a company home. I think it was Her Her Herman and H&M and they had closed. So we started capital distributing with them to supply, um, you know, the stores with groceries and those needs. And, 
and uh, similar to the fuels business, we sold groceries to our own stores and anybody. Um, and so that company's grown over the years. Um, you know, the Jet Center came along, I believe in the early 2000s. Um, we did the extra mile joint venture with Chevron about five years ago. Uh, we have a small partnership and a software company that runs the software at our warehouse. Um, and yeah, that's grown into a lot of things, you know, real estate holdings. Um, we have a decent uh, real estate portfolio of, you know, mostly, you know, sites that had, you know, at one time been a convenience store. Or it was part of a convenience store package, but, um, you know, fast food restaurants and we had an office building in downtown Boise at one time, but, uh, you know, a lot of things that going on and we just keep grinding I'm gonna drill, away. I'm going to drill down on a few of those things. So talk a little bit about the vertical integration that you do, because I think that, I mean, you get around smart business people, you'll see this path where they're growing and then all of a sudden they vertically integrate and it really, really takes off. But capital distributing, your new facility is unbelievable. I got the privilege of coming down and touring it with you and it's it's automated it's it's really cool to see how many square feet is it tell us a little bit about it uh yeah capital's grown into a nice company and we have a food manufacturing plant out there as well but we are currently uh right around three hundred fifty thousand square feet in that building it's on 52 acres so we have plenty of room to grow but you know the vertical integration i mean it really started with the wholesale fuels and kind of morphed into capital distributing and uh, you know, we've, we've tried other things that didn't work. I mean, one thing, uh, you know, we didn't, John is not going out trying to do these things just for the sake of doing them. He says, I don't, I don't mind losing money, but I hate to go to work to do it. So if it doesn't work, <laughs> we're going to get out of it. Um, and we've certainly got out of a number of things and, you know, there's more things that we're looking at right now that we'll probably not be doing in the near future either. So, um, you know, other companies in our industry have done some similar things not a lot um you know quick trip in wisconsin uh casey's is a big publicly traded company that does similar things that we that we do uh even circle k to some extent they have a warehouse in in arizona but so it you know other other folks in our industry have um found that these similar things work so you know why not that's awesome tell us the story behind the bananas the bananas uh, well by the way I'm probably like I'm like the I'm like the diet coke guy I get my free banana like I want to hear I mean if you look at the stats I'm sure I'm in the top 10 percent there you go um, I always feel better about it too when I get my banana with my diet coke hey bananas good healthy treat you know um, I've been fortunate I've been in a couple share groups one of them for about 20 years and uh, quick trip is a company that's in that group and they've been very, uh, very successful selling bananas for a long time. And I don't know if you're aware, but uh, at one time, the statistics were, you know, banana is the number one selling item in a grocery store. Um, you know, a high frequency purchase, um, we're able to, you know, offer them at a fair price through our distribution network. We made the investment to have banana ripening rooms. So we buy them in full containers, green, uh, they're in a ripening process that we get new bananas every day. Um, it's, it's not an easy fruit to, to do correctly every day and every week's different. And, and sometimes our quality is not what we'd like it to be, but we made that commitment. Uh, you know, we're always trying to find something that we're known for and bananas is, is becoming something that we're, we're known for. And, you know, it's a healthy treat that, you know, people can eat more than once per day. And, and gives us the ability to diversify in a product that not all convenience stores can sell well, and not all con convenience stores can sell for 39 cents or give away free with multiple promos. Uh, I love it. I think it's been great. I think <clears throat> when you think of your stores, who was I talking to? I was, I was talking to someone who, who's not from here and they're like, oh, Jackson store. I love when I go in them, they all feel the same, right? And I think that's probably part of your deal is you want to have that that feeling and it's always cleanliness, you know, service, the banana thing. I mean, you do a lot to brand yourself, right? Correct. And, you know, we, we try and, you know, again, trying to keep it simple. Uh, you know, we've grown through acquisition, so it, it's tough for us to have the same footprint in every location, but we, we kind of try and break it down into, in, into, into 
areas of the store that are same, like, you know, a consistent check stand or con con consistent coffee bar or consistent hot foods bar. You know, our schematics are, you know, very consistent and, and, and broken down in pieces. Um, you know, not all stores carry the, the exact same items. Some are larger than others, but a, a lot of it comes down to, you know, making it easy to execute. Uh, you know, these running these stores is not easy and, and, you know, communicating what needs to be done to all of our employees is not easy. So, you know, we try and focus on few things and do few things well and not try and be everything to everybody. Um, you know, and, and, and that really speaks to the heart of our company. It, you know, it all starts with the employee and uh, we try and do things for our employees that most people won't. And if our employees are happy, they'll take care of our customers and our customers will be happy and keep coming back. So try and keep things consistent so they can consistently execute. I love it. Let's talk about the labor market. You, how many employees do you guys have currently? Uh, just over 5,000 wow. in, all, in all companies, yeah. 5,000 employees. What are some of the constraints and how have you seen that over the last few years? How's that going? Well, it's, it's always uh, a challenging piece of our business. Um, you know, our turnover uh, relative to the industry is, is we always perform better than the industry. So we generally feel like when it's tough on us, it's tougher for the competition. So we almost look at it as an advantage, bring on the problems. Most people don't like to work that hard. Um, but, you know, currently, you know, every market's different, but we, we, the last couple of years have been pretty pretty good knock on wood that you know we'll see what the future brings but through COVID it was you know it was a tremendous challenge I mean everything through COVID was tough in our business um, you know and historically it's 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 certainly not easy but um, you know one thing you get with scale is you know we have uh, a lot of strong employees we have a, a strong HR department I mean we've got plenty of things to work on but we've got nice benefits and we have a foundation uh, that we use um, uh, for employees in need for hardship programs, mm -hmm. whether they have a, a health issue or a dental program or different things. And, um, you know, John signs off on all those personally. I just, at one time I told him, I go, you, you want me to approve those e emails? I mean, I know you get a lot of emails. I can, I can handle those. And he goes, no, I like to see those. Oh, and, wow. you know, there's probably, you know, depending on the month, five to 10 folks a month that are getting money from that foundation to take care of a hardship wow. program that's specific to them and their family. That's great. What are, what are, so it was interesting yesterday, I got to be part of a panel, the president and CEO of the, the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank was in town and there was a small group of us. You should have been there actually, because uh, it would have been great. But one of the things that they talked about was labor. And as they went around the table talking to people, some of the people were having tremendous turnover like it was um, there was someone there from the daycare industry there was someone there from uh, the Hayden beverage guy was there and talking about all the different employees turnover what are what are some secrets you've had some of it's taking care of them some of it's a benefits package how do you keep culture because the one thing about your stores is you know that the the larger it gets the harder it gets and you're at 5,000 employees what are what are some of the things you would suggest that that help culture well um you know, it's no one thing. I mean, it's a lot of things added up to be something great. But, I mean, it really starts with just being genuine, being true, um, setting clear standards. We have uh, really good training programs, uh, computer-based learning modules that help. Uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of recognition programs for our employees, uh, Christmas parties, summer picnics, you know, monthly picnics in the office. But... Uh, you know, we, we do uh, a, a trip every year for the top 10% of our employees. Mm. Um, but the people that, you know, that know, you know, myself or my dad, you know, they and, and others in our company, I mean, you know, we try and be genuine. We try and listen to them. I mean, and that's one of the things that is tougher as you get larger. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you know, John probably knew everybody in the company and knew him well. I mean, that's, you know, virtually impossible with 5,000 people. So... The larger we get, you know, we, we want to try and maintain that family business yeah. mentality. Um, we make decisions fast and, and we're long term players. I mean, we're not making decisions for the next quarter to make a month. And, you know, some of those decisions aren't easy, but we want to, uh, you know, we want to be here long term and we want to do the right things for those employees long term. And I think they feel that and um, they respect us for it. And 
I, I, love, I love what you said there because uh, it came up yesterday, but you know, uh, a, a, any company can have words on a wall or, Hey, these are our mottos. Here's our things. But, but employees just see right through that immediately. If it's not genuine, it's not authentic. And it, it usually comes from the top, right? It's sure. like, what's the standard? What, what's our ethos? Where are we, where are we coming from? And I think, I think people, uh, see through those anything that's not real or authentic i think you're in trouble that's probably why you're so successful um <clears throat> what are what are uh as you look at, at your industries there's a whole bunch of them and, and as you're going through these times we're in um are the, what are the challenges you guys have well there's a lot of challenges out there um you know the the business is more complex than it used to be um, and it's changing more rapidly than it used to be so, you know, keeping up to date with all the IT technologies that are out there, because uh, there's a lot of them, you know, where do you invest your dollars and, and when are you cautious? Um, you know, competition is, is growing rapidly as well. So there's a, a lot of competition and, um, you know, it's, it costs more. These, you know, a convenience store 20 years ago was a fraction of what one cost today. And, the land is expensive, uh, you know, and, and, you know, one road project can change traffic patterns and ruin an entire investment. Hmm. So the stakes are high and, um, you know, it's, it's much more complex than it used to be. And, you know, fortunately we do have some scale so that, that, uh, does give us advantage, um, relative to a lot of players out there, but it, it's, it's just more challenging and more complex and, and changing more quickly than ever. Yeah. That, <clears throat> I keep going back to yesterday because that came up a bunch yesterday, just how complicated everything seems to be. And at the same time, there seems to be more, more uncertainty, like just predictability. Most business folks just want a predictable economy. They want predictable politics. They don't want division they want it's just and the times we're in right now are just so crazy that everyone around the table is saying if we could just get stability and leadership and you know and that's not a republican or democrat statement it's just like it just seems so at each other and and so much just stuff right now that um in fact the one guy yesterday i loved what he said he's like i just want to go back to where i ran my business yeah and i worried about my employees and my business but now i'm having to worry about all this 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 stuff that this wasn't ever part of it <clears throat> um you see that too absolutely i mean <clears throat> you know every legislative season you know it, was, it used to be something that we you know we just paid attention to but we didn't get too involved in it uh but you know and, and not so much in idaho but you know we do business in california and oregon and washington and so the a lot of states to keep track of and um you know in a lot of change in those environments and um yeah it, it uh it it is unnerving with some of the bills that you see and that have you know potentially some very dramatic impacts to your business and um you know i, I you know inflation is something that you know we've the world's been talking about for the last few years and and uh, you know we would all like it to cool down just a little bit but you know, all this uncertainty that we feel and, and, uh, I don't want to call it government regulation, but I don't want to get too political, but you know, some of these things create the inflation yeah. that we all yeah. want to prevent. And, um, I think sometimes, uh, you know, some of the government officials don't necessarily recognize all that. And I'm not necessarily saying just in Idaho, but we, you know, there's a lot of things in our industry that, uh, that, um, are yet to be determined and that's going to have a big impact. And you probably see because you're in so many different states, different state legislation, and it always. It, it, one of the things that I just don't understand. I don't understand how how states don't learn from other states that you can't regulate yourself into anything. You regulate yourself into higher pro, uh, prices, and you regulate you regulate businesses out of existence is what you do, and that's probably pretty good to be in Idaho, right? Because it, of it's, that. it's good to be in Idaho, um, and 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 yeah, I mean it's different states have different programs going on but you know you know now we're seeing more you know municipalities doing different yeah. things so it's it's uh it's hard to keep track of all of it and um and we don't keep track of all of it. we just the other day ran into an issue in arizona and we're like well we didn't know that that law was passed so apologize but we'll clear that up but <laughs> 
it, you know, you, you didn't, they didn't send us a letter. I didn't read about it in the newspaper. Uh, yeah. Hey, I, was, I, I didn't have this on my list, but like being a frequenter of the, of your, your, your shops a lot, what, give us a breakdown on what are your most popular, like if you just do it, fuel and then you go into inside the, the convenience store, what are kind of the top categories that, that generate revenue for you? Well, the top categories and units, I mean, bananas is, is, is right there. Um, you know, all, all the beverages, yeah. um, you know, whether it be water and Gatorade and energy drinks, those things. I mean, I, in our industry, I, I typically tell people if you can't eat it or drink it be, between the time you're at the register to your car, it's probably not going to sell very well. Hmm. I mean, there are, um, other items that don't fit in that mold. I mean, we do, pr we do well locally with, you know, gallons of milk, um, even eggs. We're, we're, we're selling more eggs than we used to. And that's not true in all stores, but in Treasure Valley, we, we, we do pretty well in those grocery items. Um, but you know, it's beverages and, you know, um, lunchtime snacks and, you know, breakfast is a, we do well with, you know, when people are, don't have time. Yeah. We, when you know when people in the morning they don't have time to stop for breakfast so they can stop at a jackson's and get something quick and still be at work on time uh you know so we do well monday through friday at breakfast saturday and sundays probably don't really even make much much for breakfast hey, how does how does the lottery stuff work the lottery um well the, the you know we certainly sell a yeah. lot of lottery and very only, low margin the only reason it makes i'll be in a hurry and I'll have, I swear I get behind someone that wants to turn in like five or six or seven things every time. Yeah. Uh, you got the self checkout now, but we do. And, and we're in, installing more lottery kiosks, but yeah, that lottery can, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a great program for Idaho and Idaho schools, but, but it's a pretty low margin. For it's you. very low. It's the lowest margin item in the store. Um, but it, you know, it, it is, it is a traffic driver, yeah. but it, it does um, slow down those check lanes once in a while, which mm -hmm. is something we always contend with. Uh, self checkout's got to be a hit, right? It, it's, you know, it, yes and no. I mean, the industry's still kind of um, trying to figure that out. Yeah. You know, we, we've just, I'd say we, we've, we've got about 15, 20 locations that have it, and um, you know, the top third of those are doing pretty well. That. Uh, some of the others are, are not so much. Um, but I like it. It, it works um, better in in some of the busier locations yeah. that are in a good neighborhood. Um, some of the locations that give uh, you know too many buy one get one freeze when there's not a buy <laughs> one get one free on that item. So that's something that we're <laughs> trying to pay attention to. So do you um, have, do you have a lot of theft? I didn't think about that. We, we we unfortunately there's you know theft is something that we contend with in this industry and. Um, you know, we, we perform well in that regard too. I and mean, a lot of that, um, you know, we have less theft in, in Boise than we do in some of the urban yeah. markets that we're in. And, and, and Boise is actually, unfortunately, not as good as it used to be, but, you know, you look at towns like Homedale and Wilder, Wilder that, you know, there's very little theft and some of our stores in downtown Boise, unfortunately, um, it's going a little bit the other way, but that's something that we contend with. And, you know, that's part of what part of the business. Can we talk about Boise State and your your stuff you're doing here? Absolutely. Your, your cards. Yeah. yeah. First of all, huge supporters. Uh, name name the arena and basketball. Well, before we get there, talk about the extra mile acquisition. That was a big deal. Right? It was, yeah, it was a big deal. Um, you know, extra mile was a brand that Chevron created. I believe it was maybe 1990. And they they used that brand in their own company operated stores. And then they had a franchise that they went to market with and um, <clears throat> they had grown that to about 850 locations and Chevron decided that wasn't necessarily core to their business and they wanted a, uh, a an operating partner to help them with that brand. So um, we did that deal with Chevron. We're 50-50 joint venture partners and it's a board managed company. Um, we have uh, an office in Pleasanton, California, mm -hmm. a guy that runs that business. Um, so that's kind of how that started and um, is, is where, where we're at with that today. But So that's why in town you'll see converted Chevron, well, the, the Chevron stores are all extra mile now. Correct. Right? So you might have an extra mile on a Jackson's, but it's because of the agreement that 
they're dual branded. Correct. I mean, Chevron felt that, you know, if we were going to own part of that extra mile brand, we ought to use it. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, we agreed with them. And, and uh, so, you know, most of our Chevron locations are branded extra mile. There's a few that aren't uh, for various reasons, but um, <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's our go-to-market strategy with Chevron. Some background before we get to Extra Mile Arena. So named uh, was Taco Bell for a long, long time, and then you guys took it over probably four, three years ago, four yeah, years ago? Yeah, four or five years ago. I mean, uh, when we did that deal with Chevron, converted our sites, I mean, part of that franchise program, there's there's marketing funds that are part of that program, and uh, we thought it was a perfect opportunity to do something big in this community. At the same time, we branded our stores, and... You know, John uh, went to Boise State, been a long time Boise State fan, and, um, you know, it was hard to resist that opportunity, and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been great. And then uh, now let's get to the cards, because I know you guys, you guys are huge supporters, and the NIL thing has been an opportunity, but first one's in the nation, right? No one else has done this. Yeah, that's what, that's what I've been told. I mean, I, I can't <laughs> uh, confirm that, but uh, that's what we've been told, and it, it's a local company that's, that we actually did that with. Um, and it, it all... You know, we did the bobbleheads years ago. Yeah. I don't know if you remember yeah, the bobbleheads. Bobble they were a huge, huge hit. Um, but, you know, bobbleheads take time. Um, you, they're on the slow boat from China, and by the time they get get here in today's world, that player may not be here anymore. So, <laughs> That's actually, uh, yeah. and they were expensive. And you know, John still wants us to bring the bobbleheads back, and hope maybe one day we will. But. The trading cards seemed a uh, little simpler and Boise State was agreeable and interested in that. And it's been a fun program. Oh yeah. I, I, uh, I think for the players, it's really cool. And then the way it works with NIL and the excitement amongst fans. And I, I even think of my grandson. I mean, we stopped by to get cards and after the, it's, it's a big deal. So it's been a huge hit. Um, how has it been working with the with the current Boise State administration and and their team down there? They seem like they're doing making every right decision. Yeah, no, it's been great. And uh, Todd Michael in our office uh, runs our marketing department. He he handles most of that for us. And he's a big sports fan. Played uh, basketball in college and uh, and played basketball locally in high school here in Boise at Capital High School. But so t Todd has been instrumental in making that thing work. We did the first NIL deal uh, last year. Boise State, State was great to work with. It was kind of interesting. I mean, uh, you know, most of the things that we deal with, there's you know, a lot of letter regulation. There's a lot of rules. Uh, you know, Boise State didn't really know exactly how NIL was going to work. We certainly didn't know how it was going to work. And so we pretty much just did whatever we wanted to. And, and it's still a little bit the wild, wild west with all that NIL stuff. But uh, we had fun with it last year and having fun with it this year. And, uh, you know, we're doing in the Horseshoe Collective. Yeah. Uh, we're donating 25 cents to every hot dog sold in I, oh, I didn't know that the collective. So um, that has been a big boost. So um, if you're a Boy State fan and buy a hot dog at Jackson's, you're supporting your team. 25 it's, cents it's, at a time. And every dollar, I mean, it's like, I can't imagine doing, going through that right now, competing with these other bigger schools and the amount of dollars that are flowing and, so every little bit helps because it's, I mean, you think that Genty's still here for what he was paid and what he could have been paid. I, that, that, did you see this, the thing that Chris Peterson did, the interview with him last week? I, I, it was I did. really good. It made me proud because I think a lot of that is he loves this place and loved the administration and, the and coach. coaches and stayed here. Uh, but what he could have been paid anywhere else. Can you imagine a Genty bobblehead right now? I'm, I'm uh. with John. We didn't. We, we if we would have done it, we wouldn't have bought enough of them because <laughs> they'd have been sold out by now. But oh, I hope he wins the Heisman. I, I it's this. Uh, we're talking. We were talking about this morning with our guys because, you know, can you imagine if he played more than a half on some of these things? But then, the this flip side of that is, can you imagine him getting hurt in the third quarter of a forty-point blowout? Yeah, the, everyone would lose their job. So yeah. I get it, but. I hope. I think. I think he's going to play a lot. A lot here as well. I don't know. They, they're playing so well. It's just all these blowouts. It's been fun. Yeah, it's going to be. It's been a long time since I've been this excited to be a Bronco fan, and I mean, it's uh, it's as good as it's ever been, if not better. And it's going to be a great season. Yeah, I think Jeremiah is like that guy's legit. I mean, you look at what he does, how hard he works, the way he leads and rallies and. Really glad they signed him to an extension. I was worried about that. 
it seemed like it took a while. And anyway, I just think the world of him. Yeah, he's he's done a great job, and um, you know we're fortunate to have him here. And and uh, yeah, the program's doing great. Hey, um, let's go to com- you guys. Uh, kind of shifting gears from business to community. Um, when I think of your dad and your family and the legacy and kind of legacy families here in Idaho, it's Jackson's like, there's not a, there's not a community, uh, cause that it's not, you're, you're not at the table. Um, what are some challenges you're, you're worried about here in the Treasure Valley or for Idaho as we kind of, kind of experience all this growth? Any, any thoughts? Well, I mean, for me, it's affordable housing. I mean, we hear that from our employees and, you know, you read about it and that's certainly going to be an issue ongoing. Uh, you know, I, I, I worry about what traffic's going to be like long term and, and, you know, as we grow all the other uh, pitfalls that a lot of large cities have to deal with, whether it be crime or, or whatnot, which, you know, Boise still feels very much like Boise to me. Um, it, I mean, it's changed a lot and, um, you know, it, it there's a few corridors where the traffic in the last two or three years has just exploded. And you just wonder what the next three to five yeah. years are gonna look like. And you know, I lived in Phoenix in the late 90s and I'll never forget uh, you know, two statistics and I probably 97, I think there were 60 or 70,000 people that moved to Phoenix that year or in the metro area. And they built 60 some miles of freeway out of the desert in that year. Yeah. And um, you know, ITD and, and ACHD, I mean, you know, they're, they're great. And they're looking at this. I, I don't know if they have the money to do what they need to do. And I'm not an expert on, uh, you know, how the government is addressing that in Idaho, but it, it feels like, um, you know, there's going to be some real issues to contend with. And, um, you know, there's very few north south routes. I mean, the Highway 16 extension is going to change the valley dramatically, and you know that's going to be great. But you know, Hill Road and uh, Chinden and Highway 44, and you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how they contend with all that traffic. I mean, State Street, uh, Boise's not the easiest place to get in and out of from from Eagle. Yeah, and I think uh, well, and, and with Micron and what they're doing there, I think we've got a little group together with uh, Garrett Lofto that. Um, we're trying to help government, but it's there's only room for one more lane on this freeway, and that's it. I mean, there's right away for one more, but even with that, because it's another lane, it only increases capacity by, by a, it's less than 20%. And then once you're there, you're like, okay, what's the next what's the next pop off? Because it's already tough at some times of the day, and now you you think 10 years like 10 years will go by like that, and then what's the plan? Um, I don't know. It's a, that's, that's a tough one. And, but we better get to not just plans, but plans for funding, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, Idaho's got, it has a history of being frugal with their money yeah. and, and I, I love that about Idaho and that's the Idaho way. And that's why we're successful and able to enjoy the lifestyle that we have. But I don't know that, you know, with all the growth that they have that, you know, they may need to think about that a little differently and, borrow a little bit more money up front and spend $10 million instead of waiting and paying cash for it when it's a hundred million dollars. And that's a very conservative principle, right? I mean, I've argued that forever. Like if you underwrite it correctly, just like a business would, and, and there's one more layer to it. It's also a very conservative principle to have the people that are going to be using it, pay for it. So if they were able to get these bondings bonds, because our bonding rating is so phenomenal here because of the job that government does done here, paying for that over time, with the people that are actually using it is a very conservative principle. We just got to get ahead of it. And I think like the Garvey bonds, they were a wild success. I think, you know, I remember about 15 years ago and how some of the legislators in Canyon County were really against using any more of those bonds to improve the freeway. And I thought it was hilarious because as soon as the traffic got bad enough, <laughs> it sailed through that legislature as quick as anything else. But I think they've, they've proved themselves out too. I think they're being paid off and it was a great way to grow and otherwise you couldn't have done it with cash. So I, I agree with you hundred percent. I, I hope we do that. Housing, any thoughts? What, what do you think the solution is there? You know, I, I wish I knew. I mean, I, it, it um, that's a tough, a tough scenario. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate to see, you know, if you haven't been in the housing market for the last 10, 20, 30 years, it's, it's tough to be able to afford that down payment. And, um, I know when I moved back here in 2001, I, you know, you could, 
buy a lot of house for $175,000. I mean, that's, that's not in the cards anymore. And um, I, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, you've got a lot of folks from moving in from out of state that have a lot of equity and it, they can afford five, six hundred thousand dollars on a house and that's cheap to them. And then you have um, the younger generation and other Idahoans that haven't owned a home that, you know, that that looks like, a, you know, an unachievable goal. And that's unfortunate. Um, I, I don't really know what the solution is. I, I you know, I know, um, you know, development is, is always a challenge and, you know, we all want a city that looks good and functions well, but, um, you, you know, as you know, I mean, building anything is, is very difficult and very expensive. And, um, uh, you know, if there are a way to, to try and streamline that a little bit in certain pockets of the state or the Valley, which I, I know they've done, but I mean, it's unbelievable how many apartments that we've built in the last few years, but it doesn't feel like it's been enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, same with homes, but, um, I don't know. I, I wish I had a solution for that. I, I really don't, but, um, I know there's a lot of good people thinking about it and I'm sure Idahoans will figure that out. Yeah. Well, ultimately it's going to be supply and demand, right? The demand's not going anywhere. So we got to figure that out. <clears throat> I do think the apartment thing, it came up in our thing yesterday too. The one thing that's going to be really interesting is I think there was a lot of them. And then that model for how they were being built at the rate they were being built, the cap rate, they've all kind of stopped if you weren't under construction there's been now a period of probably 12 to 18 months where there's been nothing new and i don't know when that loosens up again i think rates probably still need to come down a bit but i think we're going to have this thing where there was some rent compression for a short time and then i think we're really in for it because then when micron is online and then then catching up because it's going to be more expensive and harder and so i worry about that a little bit but um ultimately it's regulation how do we free up and let the free market do what they do, which is help on the supply side, because with as gorgeous as this place is, and with all the things we have here, I, we're discovered. Like the idea that we're not going to be having more people come here is probably not going to happen. Talk uh, that makes me think of our times going fast here, but Idaho. I know you're a you're a big time Idaho Idaho fan. What, what does the state mean to you and your family? Well, it means everything. I mean, I was I was born here. Uh, most of my grandparents were born here. So, you know, I, I joked with my wife. She, she moved here when she was 12. So she likes to call herself an Idaho. And I'm like, you're not really an Idaho. And you, you, you got to be here more than one generation for that to happen. She's like, 30 years is enough. I'm like, OK, I agree. But I mean, it, it it's a great place. Um, you know, I, I, I went to college in Utah. Uh, first job was in Seattle and then was transferred to Phoenix. So I, I was I've been in the state for my entire life with the exception of nine years. And I did an internship in Washington, DC for a few months. So of all the places I've lived, I mean, there's, there's nothing quite like it. Um, I mean, the people here are friendly, uh, you know, the, the recreational opportunities are outstanding. Um, you know, it's just a great place. Um, so it, Idaho means the world to me and, you know, I want to do whatever I can to, um, make sure that you, you know, this lifestyle is protected for future generations. And, um, you know, I think, I think we've grown, um, done a great job managing growth thus far, although I, I think it's going to get tougher. I mean, the things you just mentioned, I mean, those are the complicated issues than, that uh, we see in our business that just feels like it's more complicated than it used to be and it's changing faster. I mean, you, you know, the difference between 3% growth in one year and 8% growth in one year is, is huge yeah and that could have you know nobody knows what idaho is going to grow in the next two three years i mean they have projections but it, it feels like those projections i'm not even exactly sure what they are but if anything they, they might not be strong enough i i had it yesterday or monday i was with rebecca hupp who runs our airport and she had a line that i'm going to use over and over again i was talking to her about just how things were going and and she said well we had a 20-year master plan that became our five-year work plan. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me, and she's like, we had a 20-year master plan and we basically completed it in five years because of growth. So think about, when, I don't think anyone saw this coming. In fact, you go back 10 or 15 years ago, we were talking about um, talent pipeline and how do we get wages up and how do we do all this? And then what happened was we were discovered. And I think a lot of that had to do with the coasts and messes there and then COVID and then people going, oh, this is a great place to live. 
and it's just not stopping now. And it's, it's tough to, it's tough to get out in front of that once it starts, but I, I, I'm betting on us too. I think you think of the companies that are here and our government here the you know, there are a lot of stress and strain on our cities, but we've got great leadership. We've got great city councils. We've got some of the problems that other places have, we don't have. So I'm, I'm betting on us, but it's not going to be easy. No, it's not, but I'm, I'm betting on us as well. And, um, all the folks you just mentioned are, are, are their hearts in the right place and, and they're, they're looking at it the right way. And I'm confident we'll, we'll, uh, continue to grow the straight at a stay state at a pace that everybody's happy with. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't want to see it grow. I mean, I, I, and I've met a lot of them, you know, actually, you know, probably most of the old school Idahoans do not want growth. Yes. And I think most of them recognize that it's here and there's nothing they can do about it. And some of them are trying to figure out where they're going to move next. But, um, you know, so I, I think that's something that needs to be cont contended with as well. I mean, you know, improving our infrastructure is only going to help us grow faster. And, you know, maybe that's, maybe we, we don't want to go full bore with that either. I don't know. That is an important question, but, but think about this. If you don't really do anything for demand, you just drive up prices by doing that. Right. Absolutely. So, so, so although I get it, I'm like, okay, but you have kids that want to be here. I mean, like there's, you know, I guess you'd have to get to a point where people would just say, oh, I am not going there because traffic is an hour long. And I don't think we're going to see that. I think, I think we better. I, I agree. I, mean, I, I, I do travel fair amount in my job and, you know, wherever I go, when people ask me where I'm from and, you know, you don't meet anybody that just doesn't come back with, you know, oh, I've heard great things yeah. about Boise and, you know, know somebody that's been there. I want to check it out. Or, I mean, it, it is all across Everywhere. this state country and it only feels like the momentum's growing. So, um, you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's happening. Well, Hey, this was great. Thank you. And, and, uh, tell John, thanks for us too. I mean, what a, what a legend and thanks for coming on, uh, your name's everywhere. And it's nice that people get to hear about your family and we really appreciate coming on today and learning a little bit more about the, about the Jacksons and, and for all you do, of course, I, I'm going to tell them one more story. Sure. Um, so about three or four years ago, we heard about a family that needed, um, they needed a bunch of stuff done. I won't go into all the details, but part of it involved taking this family and moving them into a hotel for a few months while we, uh, while we remodeled their house and they had a bunch of kids and, um, we had, to, we made one call to you and you delivered food to them every day for two months. And yeah. I remember that. I think <laughs> our food plant got behind that a little bit and, yeah, it, I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't, hey, I'm going to do a little donation. You guys actually delivered food for two months. And I, I think if any, if any small story can tell a larger story about you and your family, uh, it, it, was, it was really cool. And I think that's the Jacksons. That's the legacy. It's like, where's the need? Point us in the direction and we take care of things. But um, anyway, appreciate you guys. Thanks for coming on. No, thank you. Thank you, Tommy. It's been a pleasure. And, and uh, Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.